Christian character and the growth of Christian character. And I want to talk to you today about love and the Christian. And uh, I think that as Christians, we understand God is love and um, we're to love one another. But I just want to reaffirm it, if I can put it that way. And some people are more loving than other people. And um, so some of us struggle with that concept of love more, more than some other people. I remember back in Adelaide when I, we were doing a, a marriage seminar and I actually asked Brother Holden what love is. And um, I'm not sure what the answer was, but I, I hope I've got a little better handle on it now than I had then, but it doesn't mean I've got a complete handle on it. So, but we do want to talk about uh, love and the Christian and hopefully uh, these things will probably be, you've heard it all before, but uh, it'll just refresh our memory at the same time. So I want to start with Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 uh, to 40. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. Father, we do thank you for your presence that is here once again this morning. And Lord, uh, uh, that presence we feel is the expression of your love toward us. And Lord, we don't want to ever take that love for granted. But Lord, we understand that we're not perfect people. Lord, we let you down in so many ways. But Lord, you've never withdrawn that love from us. You, you have um, provoked us. You have convicted us because we maybe walk away uh, from you to some extent. But Lord, uh, uh, your motive for uh, uh, convicting us, for speaking to our hearts is that you want to draw us back under that covering of the love of God. And Lord, we just pray that as we look at this subject this morning, we draw closer to you. Lord, that we'd have a desire to be more like you, we pray. We just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love your na- thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So uh, what he's saying is that uh, we are to love God and to love our neighbor. And the Old Testament is full of thou shalt and thou shalt nots. And, uh, and the Jews had trouble with that. And even in, the, um, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you need to go further than what the Old Testament says. In other words, uh, m- murder is one thing, but if you hate somebody, then, then uh, that is the same as murder. So just our motive is important to God. And, uh, and, and God is uh, telling us, Jesus is telling us here that all the law depends on loving God and loving your neighbor. Because if we love God, we will try and please him. You know, I, I've, I've struggled for 40, 50 years, long time, uh, to please Ellen because I love her. Uh, and I, I probably haven't got it right yet. In fact, I'm, I think I fall a bit short, but she never growls me. But, but, you know, this is a process. And so with us loving God, God, God is looking for us to love him. And if we, if we will love him, we'll do the things that please him. And in actual fact, if we love our neighbor, we'll do the things that please our neighbor. And so if we're loving God and loving our neighbor, all the law is wrapped up in those two elements, loving God and loving your neighbor. So uh, sin comes from selfishness. So if we lay self down and seek the, the ministering to the other, God and, and humanity, then we're going to fulfill all the law. Uh, and in actual fact, when the Old Testament said thou shalt and thou shalt not, didn't make it any easier for us to fulfill it. But in the New Testament, we have the Holy Ghost and God has put his love in us. So it's actually easier for us to fulfill the law. It's, this is not a miserable life we're living. This is a good life we're living. And uh, so Jesus said to love God and love, love your neighbor. And in Mark Chapter 12, verse 31, in part it says, There is none other commandment greater than these. So those are the two greatest commandments. And so if you fulfill those commandments, Jesus is saying you're going to fulfill all of the commandments. 
And human beings want and seek to be loved. We all want to be loved. You know, you might say, oh, that's not true, but we all want to be loved. In fact, mankind talk about it, they sing about it, they write poems, songs and novels about it because love is so important to them. Now, they may not have the right concept of love, but they think they do and so they, they feel to write songs, poetry, books on love because God's put something in us that we, are, we need that love. We, 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 we're looking for it, although we have a poor concept of it. Love is one of the most powerful human emotions that we can know. Love protects. Love will go to great lengths. It's a, it's a very powerful emotion. And that emotion is given to us by God. But love goes beyond emotion as well. So we'll, look, we'll, talk, we'll talk to you uh, more about the love that is an action more than the love that is an emotion. And if you don't, if you don't, if you don't feel that emotion of love, if you will act, if you will act is a verb, uh, sorry, love is a verb, and if we will love people, the feeling for people will come. God, God's, not, God's not interested. He put the emotion in us, but he's not interested in the emotion as much as whether we practice love, whether we do love. And if we want to understand, first of all, God is love. First John 4, 4 and 16 tells us that in part, God is love. And uh, uh, Madison got it up, so we'll read the whole thing. <laughs> and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So if God's in us, we ought to be manifesting some love. But God is love. No doubt about it. God is love. And God's greatest expression of love for humanity was embodied in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you want to have an idea of what the love of God is all about, you can read the Old Testament and see how, how he's intervened in people's lives. But the greatest embodiment of love was in Jesus Christ. And uh, the Bible talks about agape love. And when it talks about agape love, we just read it as love because we're not Greek, okay? But when we read about love, it's in the English translation, it can cover several things. But agape love is a sacrificial love. It's the love of God expressed in the unselfish sacrificial love that he direct, directed toward us on Calvary. So when Jesus went to Calvary, uh, he was hung there by humanity, but the reason he hung there was because he loved humanity. They didn't understand. They were just, they wanted blood, but they didn't understand that the blood that he shed on Calvary was going to reach down the tunnel of time and reach all humanity, even us. That's why we get excited about the blood, because it's still effective in our lives today. And Calvary is the greatest expression of love that you will find. He gave himself. I don't think there's a better song. There's good songs, but I don't think there's a better song than the last song, song we sang about the effectiveness of the blood. And we need to stay under the blood, covered by the blood. But that is the expression of the agape love of God. And in actual fact, it's impossible. We're only human beings. We have the Holy Ghost in us, but he wants us to express that sacrificial love to everybody around us. And the problem, because we're human, it's easy for us to love Clyde, but it's not so easy to love coffee. Do you understand? Do you understand? You know, we, we are biased people. We love coffee, I love you. Okay, but you know, I'm just trying to say, we are biased, you know, so we just, we prefer them than them. But God's love loves everybody. And so God, as Christians, we need to show that sacrificial love that we love everybody the same. So coffee doesn't feel that, oh, Phil loves Clyde more than he loves me. We should all feel that we are loved by the children of God 
because it's the sacrificial love of God that's being expressed through us. We struggle with it because our humanity gets involved with it. But Lord, help us. And it takes a lifetime, I believe, to show forth the love of God. Manifest it. Spiritual acts are of little benefit unless they are done from a heart and a life that is filled with God's love. So that we heard um, prophecy today, we heard tongues and interpretation, uh, and those things, those things, we want them in the church. But if there's no love, those things are meaningless. So the scripture tells us, or Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 uh, introduces a thought. It says, though, which points out, Five important thoughts about love. And the first one is, if we speak in tongues without love, it's just a noise. And we, we want to hear people speaking in tongues, but no love, it's just a noise. Prophecy or understanding and knowledge means nothing if there's no love. Generosity without love is of no personal benefit. You, you can give, but if there's no love, that person receives what you give them. But to you, there's no benefit. Without love, even martyrdom profits nothing. We can give our life for the cause, but if, we don't, if love's not there, it's futile. Without love, my words are empty. Without life... Without love, my life is empty. Without love, I have nothing at all. I need the love of God in my life. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 8. I think if we can do it in the Amplified. Madison, have you got the Amplified down there? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter. We call it the love chapter. And 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8 in the Amplified says, Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy, is not boastful or vainglorious does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to, the, to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices with right and truth when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. It is ever ready to believe the best of every person. It's... It, its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails, never fades out or becomes obsolete or comes to an end. As, to, as for prophecy, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, it will be fulfilled and pass away. As for tongues, they will be destroyed and cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. It will lose its value and be superseded by truth. But love never fails. Now, though that, I, I like the Amplified Version because it talks in our language. But the amazing thing, I remember being told years ago, love, that's love. And you can, put, you can actually put the name of Jesus in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he fulfills it all. But I'll let you into a secret. I don't want to disappoint you, but when I put my name there, it, do, it doesn't quite make it. 
And I've got a feeling that if you put your name there, it won't quite make it. Uh, yet that's what God is looking for in us. He is wanting us to manifest the love of God. And I absolutely believe that's a lifelong challenge. 1 Corinthians is a lifelong challenge. So, love is patient, according to King James. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Love does not act inappropriately. Love does not seek its own. Love is not easily provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love rejoices not in iniquity. Love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. I, I just give you a challenge. Next time you read it in your daily devotion, put your own name there. It's a challenge. And love, by its very nature, is unalterable. God is love. It actually doesn't matter how we behave. God is love. It's unalterable. And with us, we need to get to that stage when Jesus comes, I believe I'll get there, that my love is unalterable. We may fail, love never fails. We fail in our relationships to God and to others in the measure that our love is imperfect. And so when we fail others or God, we need, we, we need a touch in our hearts that love can be preeminent. Perfect love. Perfect love is slow to suspect, quick to trust. It's slow to condemn, but it's quick to justify. It's slow to offend, but quick to defend. Slow to expose, quick to shield. Slow to reprimand, quick to forbear. Slow to belittle, quick to appreciate. Slow to demand, quick to give. Slow to provoke, quick to conciliate. Slow to hinder, quick to help. Slow to resent, quick to forgive. Some good qualities of love. And Lord, help us to show forth those qualities. And uh, so when we're talking about love and we say it's an emotion, the fact of the matter is our, our emotions, uh, we have control over our emotions, but the fact is with, with love, Jesus commands us to love. It's a command. So therefore, uh, we'll, hope, hopefully we'll get to it later, but therefore when I say, when I, say I can't love, I am sinning. I don't know how better to put it. When I say I can't love, what I am saying is I won't love. And, uh, and to, to not do what we're commanded to do is a sin. So we are commanded to love. I don't want to disappoint you. It's a challenge for some of us. But we are commanded to love. John Chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. So how does the world know that we, we are children of God because we have love one to another? And the amazing thing also is that our love isn't just for the brethren, but he, he expects us to go further than just loving the brethren. And so in salvation, when we, ask, when, we, when we repent, we're baptized, we're filled with the Holy Ghost, We, we are set free to love. 
Because we're, when we come to salvation, when God touches our lives, we are set free from the selfishness that is rooted in us. So that before God gets a hold of us, everything you do is for your own benefit. Everything you do, you come first. You are the center of your universe before you come to God. But when God starts to deal with you, and when you come to that place of repentance and, and uh, salvation, then that selfishness, that sin that is in us is dealt with, and we have a brand new start to, to treat others as we would like them to treat us. But we are set free to love God and to love our neighbor. And in actual fact, that feels good. So when we're set free from sin and self, we are set free to love. And so we may not have been good at it before, but when we come to repentance, God is doing a work in us. It's a heart transformation. And what he's doing is he's trying to give us his heart of love. And, and the flesh still rises up. But as we walk with him, we want to do everything we can to push the flesh down. But that's where the battle is. It's for me, me, or to do the will of God. And if we can just understand those battles we're having is the flesh fighting against the spirit and the spirit is wanting us to love God and to love our neighbor. And it'll cause us to change our behavior. So, the spirit-filled person is able to love his fellow man as God loves him. Okay, so we, we can actually love people like God loves them. And we may go through challenging things, but we can still manifest the love of God. And so uh, many times um, uh, people, pe Christian people can be going through things People will misjudge them because they are trying to express the love of God and they, 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 they don't understand what their motive is. Uh, they can, the world doesn't understand the concept, so they can judge us. But what we're simply trying to do is love God and lo love others. That's what we're trying to do. And we may suppress our emotions because we care for other people. And so they may, may misread those things. But we're just trying to do, we're trying to be the people that God wants us to be. So love is calling us to give our all to Jesus, to the lost and to the brethren. That's what love is calling us to do. And, uh, and uh, we, that's our motivating force. Some hindrances to love. Some things that get in the way. Self-righteousness. Okay. I'm good, Daniel, you're not so good. You know, I deserve it, you don't deserve it so much. That is the problem. And these are things we battle with. Self-righteous, we think we're okay. You know, uh, we, somebody, if somebody does something, we say, oh, what do you think? Why would they do that? And yet we're doing the same thing, but we don't see it in ourselves because we're perfect. And so we're very judgmental on other people because we see ourselves as perfect when we're not perfect. It's only Jesus in us that's doing any transformation in our lives. And so self-righteousness, um, Christians can be very self-righteous, holier than thou. It's, it's a lie from the pit. Criticism is a hindrance to love. When we start criticizing, that's not, that's not uplifting. Uh, but again, it's easy for us to say, oh, I don't know about that. Oh, what do they think they're doing? Criticism is a hindrance to love and so we need to get the criticism out of us that love can be manifest through us personal desires and pride I, I, I want to do this now sorry Daniel I haven't got time for you because I, I want to do this you know I need some personal space as well we need to watch comments like that because personal desire and pride they're hindrances to love so they may it may feel right to say that or want that but if we love like Jesus loved us, he went, he, 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 
he robed himself in flesh and was brutalized and hung on a tree for our good. It was not, he didn't benefit from it. It was for our good. And it was, I would say, fairly inconvenient for him. And yet just the little things that we just don't want to go out of our way. Meanness, just being mean. Um, I, was t- I forget who I was talking to. I think it might have been Daniel and Fiona. But you can't outgive God. So if you want to be a mean Christian, you want to be a mean Christian, you can be a mean Christian. But let me tell you, if you will open your hand, God, you can never outgive God. And we'll probably get on to tithes and offerings. You know, we never talk about tithes and offerings here. One of these days with this series, we, we will talk about tithes and offerings. But meanness, you, you, the only person you're hurting in meanness is yourself because uh, um, Daniel has a need and I say, well, not from me, mate. Uh, God will take care of him. I've just, I'm just not getting blessed because I'm not expressing love. You understand what I'm saying? So me, mean, mean Christians, the word doesn't go together. So if you're a mean Christian... And as I said before, judging, you, being judgmental. Being judgmental, you, 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 there's a lot of things wrong in this world. If you're going to pick all the things that are wrong, you're not going to be Christ-like. Just show the love of God. The works of love, love covers sin. Proverbs 10, 12. Love works no evil. Romans 13, 10. Love serves. Galatians 5, 13. Love is an overcoming force, 2 Timothy 1.7. Love overcomes fear, 1 John 4.18. Love binds together, Colossians 2 and 2. So, I've probably mentioned already, but love who? Love God. Now, who can I love? Love God. Do you know the presence of the Lord in this place this morning? It's because he loves us, but actually it's because we love him as well. And I, 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 I need the love of God. And it's not just on Sundays I need the love of God. I need the love of God. I need to know his presence with me every day. Well, if you need the love of God, just let him know you love him. You know, if, if, I, if, if I love Ellen, I'll probably express it. I sometimes say, but, just to stir her up. But I love her. And she needs to know I love her. Then she wants to be around me. But if I never express it, if it's not, she won't want to be around me. The Lord's the same. You know, he loves us. But there are other people that love him. And if we're not going to express our love, he, he, he won't feel so comfortable in this place. But we love him and we need to express this express it. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul and with all thy might. And uh, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37 we read before, Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul and with all thy mind. We need to give God our everything. And then, as we mentioned before, loving our neighbour. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. That's Old Testament. The Old Testament is telling them the same thing. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. I am the Lord. So it's a commandment. Love thy neighbour. It's not a choice. It's something God expects of us. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. Um, we might read all that, Madison. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour. 
Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So that explains why Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor. Because if you love your neighbor, you're not going to do ill against them. Love the stranger. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19. Love ye therefore the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So we need to love, love, it's not just the brethren, we need to love the stranger. And then love your enemies. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 28. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 28. But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. We may not like that, but that's a command. And so when we are, when we are being taken advantage of, the Lord's saying we need to bless our, our enemies. Because by blessing them, who knows? You know, when somebody does something wrong, our first desire, Lord, deal with them. <laughs> and so you decide that you're going to pray for Ellen because she burnt the cooking again, burnt the tea again. So you're going to pray for her and say, Lord, teach her to cook. Why don't, why? That's not love. But you know, that's our, that's our motivation. We, we want to tell God how bad we're being dealt with. He's wanting us to pray for them. And ultimately, Ellen, you didn't cook. You didn't, I, I actually cooked last. No, <laughs> Daniel cooked last night. So, you understand, we, 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 wanted, we want God to strike them dead. That's not, that's not what we're praying for. We're praying for their soul. And in actual fact, we, we don't want our enemies destroyed. We want, surely, we want our enemies to find Jesus Christ because he's changed us. And you know, if we could just see them in church, loving God, forgiven by God, we already forgiven them. If you talk to God, your emotion will change toward them. Uh, you, may, you may express all the wrong they did to you when you start praying, but if you continue to pray for them, you'll understand they're, they're just like you. They're a sinner that needs salvation. And if they find Jesus Christ, their heart is going to be changed. And the only reason you're different to them is because God has got a hold of your heart. So loving, uh, loving your enemies, God expects us to do it because he's not willing that any should perish. And, you know, again, the flesh gets in the way and some people we don't actually care that much about. They're the ones we need to be praying for because God is not willing for any to perish. And we need to understand as well, God loved us when we were his enemy. I was very offensive. I, I used to... I use the Lord of, name of the Lord in vain. It, it absolutely flowed out of my mouth. And, uh, and um, I, I, when I was in the army, I was, I was a backslidden. I was backslidden. I wouldn't say Christian. I was backslidden. Uh, but we used to get, um, we were up in Pakapunyal and, and on the weekends you used to polish your brass and polish your boots and you used to, you used to have to spit polish your boots. So uh, that would be spitting on your boots, bit of boot polish and rubbing in with a cloth. Some of you know what I'm talking about, most of you don't. And so you're spit polishing your boots and on a Sunday night would be the night that you're spit polishing your boots. And, uh, and on a Sunday night, some of you wouldn't know this, but on a Sunday night, it was all religion. Who remembers that? Sunday night, it's all, all, all Christ grace. You're getting old, Grace. Uh, so all you got on a Sunday night was, you know, the, the, the Anglican hour or something, the this hour, the that hour. And up at Puck, Puckapunyal, we were getting from Maitland, and we were also getting one that was harvest time. So you had an hour of this or half hour of this, hour of that, hour of something, and you got harvest time. I think harvest time. They were probably all 30 minutes, Grace. So you used to get all these different things, and I'd be spit polishing my boots. And I was raised not to like Americans, so you got these harvest time preachers, and by that time I was quite 
fired up about having to listen to religion every Sunday night and it was a regular occurrence, I would throw the boots. I'd throw them because of this, this American rubbish that we were listening to. Now, when I came to the Lord, my, my pastor, who was an American, gave me a record to listen to, and it was harvest time. <laughs> now, I was an enemy of God. And I had, in Pakapanyal, I had, what, 12 weeks of an opportunity to turn to God. I heard repentance, baptism, infilling of the Holy Ghost every Sunday night. I did nothing about it, but just got angrier and angrier so angry I'd throw my boots and then I'd have to start from scratch again because they'd be dinged. But I was an enemy. You may not have been. I was an enemy of God. But he, while I was yet a sinner, he died for me. And I think he did the same for you. And loving your enemies is the real evidence of the love of God. It doesn't come from us. Loving our enemies comes from God. And it's the irritating, frustrating, exasperating experiences when the fault lies with the other person that we can truly demonstrate love, Calvary's love, the love of God toward other people. When things aren't going well, they need to see the love of God coming out of us. And another area that we... We can be perfect in all these other areas, but another area that's challenging is love in the home. And Ephesians chapter 5, 25 tells us, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So husbands, we need to love our wives. And then the wives are sitting there saying, yeah, and we don't have to love our husbands. <laughs> Titus chapter 2. Verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. So just by the way, when you're Mother's Day or Father's Day and you know, we're having a shot at the, other, the opposite sex, husbands, we need to be under subjection. The Bible says that we need to be under subjection to one another before it tells wives to be under subjection to men. And uh, certainly Ephesians tells husbands to love their wives, but Titus actually says that wives ought to love their husbands as well. And, uh, and the thing is, with the home, love can be easily neglected because in families, people see us as we really are. We think that we can just let down a bit because, after all, I'm at home and, 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 uh, and I ought to be able to relax and be myself at home. But the problem is, in the home, your family sees you at your worst. And if people are seeing you at your worst, love must not be neglected. Because love needs to still, when I am at my worst, love still needs to be manifest in my life. So I'm challenging you, in your homes, if you think, oh, I can... I can let it all hang out at home. I can just be myself. Well, myself ought to be somebody who loves God and loves my neighbour and especially my family. Loving the brethren. I don't think loving the brethren is hard, but loving the brethren is something else that we need to be doing as well. John chapter 15, verse 12. John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So loving the brethren is a sign to those around about that we belong to Christ. People ought to be able to walk in these doors and see that we love one another. And no, God is here. These people actually care for one another. And as I mentioned before, to say I cannot love, we've got a problem if we say we cannot love. Because the scripture tell us, tell, all scriptures, not just a scripture, the scriptures tell us we can and we must love. If it's a commandment, God is not asking us to do something that's impossible. So the choice is ours and we need to make the choice that we're going to love. We're going to just step out by faith 
and begin to practice love. We're not talking about the emotion of love, but we're going to practice love. And as I said before, an unwillingness to love is a refusal to act on the facts and therefore is sin. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Now this is what the Lord's going to do. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. So when we came to the Lord, this scripture is telling me he's actually circumcised our heart that we can love. And so if you're saying, I cannot love, you're saying, I am not a Christian. Because loving God and loving people is an act of God in us, not in ourselves. So if you're trying to do it by yourself, you're missing the point. We, in our humanity, in our flesh, we can't do it. We need the circumcision of the heart that is only performed by God. And if we've allowed that to happen, I think we've got the Holy Ghost. We need to let the Holy Ghost move in us, guide us, because He is equipping us to love God and to love our neighbour, to love all those that we listed down here. But here's some ways of keeping the love channels open. By recognising our own sins and ridding our lives of self. Understanding, God, you're still doing a work. I need that work done in my life. And that selfishness, Lord, I need it out of me. By praying with correct motives. So we're talking about our enemies. That was a good example. By making things right with others. So if we've got a conflict as best as in us, we need to put those things right. Be forgiving. You know, we need to, we need to have forgiven. If somebody's offended us, we need to have forgiven them. They can't have the benefit of it unless they want reconciliation, you know, if they'll say sorry. But when our forgiveness is not predicated on what they do, our forgiveness, and forgiven, lack of forgiveness is destroying you. Their lives are going on. So if you have, hold for unforgiveness in your heart, you're, it's you that you're destroying. You're not destroying anybody else. So we need to be forgiving. Forgiving. God, that person hurt me. Just, just help me to express that forgiving, for, that forgiving nature, nature that you have. Lord, don't let me hold this thing up. And forgiveness costs. I'll hold, I won't hold a grudge against them. Be willing to give of self. It's not just doing nothing. Do something. That's why even, even you know, the pantry that we give to, a very simple thing, but that's just giving, you know. It's, not, it's a very simple thing, but be giving. Be giving. Just if simple things. You may be able to do more, but just sit. Be willing to give of yourself. Be compassionate and loving toward the lost and those around about us. Now I want to talk to you about a question of love. And I've talked about this before, but I want to do it again now. So I want to look at John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. And Madison, I want you to put it up in the amplified version. And then I want you to watch and keep up with me because I'm going to be ringing the King James Version. But John chapter 21, 15 to 17, uh, is Jesus talking to Peter. And I honestly, I don't believe a lot of people understand, some of you do because I've talked about it before, but this, we can't see it because we're reading English. But Jesus is saying one thing, Peter is saying something else. And uh, and. Jesus is looking for a response from Peter and I really, I want you to look at it and understand what response are you going to give to Jesus. Take it that he's asking you and what's the response you're going to give. Now, in John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17, there are two words that are being used in this conversation. 
One is agape. I may be saying it wrong. It's the Greek word agape. I'm not a Greek, so I might be saying it all wrong. But agape, and that means to love with reasoning and intentionally with a spiritual devotion, ardently, supremely, perfectly, with my whole being, wholly submitted. It's a sacrificial love that he's talking about. And the other word that is used is filio. And filio means to have an affection for, denoting a personal attachment as a matter of sentiment or feeling. So there are two words being used. So I'm going to read the King James. Madison is going to put up the Amplified, and I want you to read the Amplified as I'm reading the King James. And I'm going to tell you as I read the King James which word is being used. John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest agape, thou me, more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love Philio thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest agape thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love Philio thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, we don't see it in the English, but they know what they're saying. And I really believe that Peter knows he's not saying what Jesus is saying. He's using a different word. It's so beautiful. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest Philio, thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest Philio, thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love Philio thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Now Jesus was asking him whether he loved him with a sacrificial love. And really, Peter was simply saying, Jesus, you're my friend. And eventually Jesus said to him, Peter, are you really my friend? And Peter could, said to him, he was very sad, but he said, you are my friend. And so they understand what's being said. And I believe that Jesus is asking us the same question today. Do you agape love me with a sacrificial love? And Mike, I'm, I'm asking you a question. You don't have to raise your hands or tell me. What is your answer? Yes, Lord. I like you with a deep, instinctive, personal affection for you as for a close friend. I'm fond of you. Is that the best you can say? Or I love you with reasoning and intentionally, with a spiritual devotion, ardently, supremely, perfectly, with my whole being submitted to you. That's the question. And Peter was grieved when he knew he had grieved the Lord. I don't want to grieve the Lord. I want to be able to say, God, I love you with everything in me. This whole being of mine is surrendered to you. And I trust you feel the same way. A piece of poetry. I don't know where it came from. Go break to the needy sweet charity bread, charity's bread. For forgiving is living, the angel said. And must I be giving again and again? My peevish and pitiless answer ran. Oh no, said the angel, piercing me through. Just give till the Lord stops giving to you. That is a good poem. I like it. But lo love people. Sacrificially give until God stops giving to you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Ephesians 5 and 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. So walk in love. God loves us. 
He really does love you. But God, help us to show forth our love toward you. That same sacrificial giving, that totally dedicated to the thing being loved, totally dedicated to 